Experiences and the emotions that they elicit in us shape our lives. They are who we become. Think about the first time that you fell in love. Or think about the first time that you disappointed your parents. Or maybe the first time you became a parent. Or if you're lucky, think about the first time that you did something professionally that you thought, I could do this for the rest of my life. Think about what that felt like. For me, I wasn't professional yet, but I remember that moment. It was a long time ago. And I remember my first interaction with a computer. I remember for me, it was wondrous that I could press a button on that keyboard and something happened on that screen. There was this link between me and my physical world and this other world. We didn't call it digital yet. That hadn't really been coined as a phrase. We didn't have the term cyberspace. So I don't know what we called it, but let's go with it was a virtual world. And it wasn't real, and yet it is real. It's of us, but it's not us. It's something we do that, you know, when we do things, we affect that virtual world, and it affects us right back. And back then, there was very little in that virtual world. That's a picture of what my first computer looked like. It wasn't connected to anything. You could just write simple little programs on it, and I thought that was fabulous. I thought it was magical. And, you know, technology in our lives today is not entirely positive. Shocker, right? There are a lot of negative implications of our technology overwired world. But I want to tell you a little bit today about something I think will be very hopeful for the future. But let's talk about experience and emotion. For most of us, if we think about what is most important to us, it's probably our family or loved ones. Right? You may have a big family or a little family, traditional, non-traditional, but whatever family means to you, those close to you, those people that you want to be with all the time, they are probably what is most important to you and where most of life's biggest moments happen or are related to, right? Those big milestones, births and deaths and big milestones in between. And yet, the thing that can get in the way of us being with those people is our health, Barring accidents and other things, most of what will take us away from them or them away from us is poor health. And yet, when we think about our healthcare system, I don't know about you, but I don't think about emotion. I don't think about experience. In fact, think for a moment about the moments in your life related to health, related to the healthcare system, that have been really uh, a, a high or a low, right? There's probably nothing in between. The moments you remember related to health were probably either really, really good news or really, really bad news. You probably don't have a lot of experience or feeling when you think about an exam room or interacting with the healthcare system. But that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because we know that health is so essential to the thing that matters the most to us. So this is a disconnect, and it's showing up in our lives in a big way, and we need to fix it. So some of you will know a lot of this, and some of you know a little bit about this, but I want to take a few minutes and talk about our healthcare system and just how unsustainable it is. So quickly, we spend $3.6 trillion a year on healthcare in the U.S. That's just the U.S., $3.6 trillion. About 80, uh, that's about 20% of gross domestic product, which is unsustainable. It's eating the economy. About 75% of that spending goes towards chronic disease. And of course, the problem with that is there's a lot of pain and suffering, right? So about 40% of our population has at least one chronic disease. That's 150 million people. 80 million or so have two or more chronic diseases. So aside from the unsustainable spending, the pain and suffering is immense. The impact on our lives and taking us away from our loved ones or them away from us is a huge problem. And you know, we're coming to understand more about health and there's a recent appreciation for what we call the social determinants of health, which is a big deal. And this is, in a nutshell, the idea that it's not all up to us. A lot of our health is determined by things that are out of our control. Where did we grow up? In what zip code? Were there health care services available? Did I have access to healthy food and transportation? Could I afford the care? So that's important, and we're coming to appreciate that better. But the data also shows that for an individual, within any given social context or health context, our behavior is, has a huge impact on how we do over the long term. 
right? Whether I have a lot of advantages or few advantages, how I choose to live my life makes a big difference in terms of lifestyle and the impact on health. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do to fix the fact that we are losing this battle. Carl Rahn is a managing director of Health 24-7 at the AMA's Innovation Institute in Silicon Valley. And he used to sell products at Procter & Gamble. And he told a story about how he sold toothpaste. And he said, you know, we didn't sell a lot of toothpaste by telling people about cavities or being uh, worried about the next dental procedure that they may have to go through if they don't take care of their teeth. But we need people to take care of their teeth. So how did we do it? Well, what they found is what was most effective is to talk about a white smile. Let's talk about the story, about who we are and who we want to be, a better version of ourselves. It's a simple story, but it's a story, right? It's like, yeah, I want to be that guy. I want to, I want to look a little more attractive and have whiter teeth. I'm in. So it's the carrot. It's not the stick. And let's look at how we do in healthcare generally with respect to trying to educate people about how to take care of themselves. With apologies to the good folks at CDC, this is just one of tens of thousands of examples of how we seek to educate people about how to take care of themselves. This is one of many. This is an important topic, hypertension, high blood pressure. Here's everything you need to know about high blood pressure and how to not let it get you. Right? And this is, this is not good. This is boring. There's no white teeth story in this. Now, how did we get here? I mean, well, part of it is we count on our clinicians, our doctors, and those around them to be professional and to, have a, to, to, to do their jobs in alignment with science. Right? We need to know that the products or services or procedures that we're engaging in are safe, effective, high quality. No snake oil, please. Right? So that's a healthy tradition in medicine. But I'm not so sure that it's healthy when you take it all the way forward into how we educate and engage people in their health. So we need to rethink this. There is a better way. Most of our lives are not about these extreme highs and lows. There's sort of all the stuff in between. And we get inspired in that world every day. And that is the realm of artists. And I want to talk about how we need to bring artistry and creativity to healthcare to drive better health. So let's look at some of the things that how art touches us. It might be a concert we go to with our friends and family, rocking out to our favorite band. It could be movies that, you know, it's adventure, it's heartbreak, it's inspiring, it's, uh, it's, it's funny, what have you. Uh, it could be about tales of adventure and dragons and thrones and things like that that really we all get into together. Or it could just be simply things that, you know, we want to appreciate the amazing skill of our fellow humans and their ability to create beautiful things that touch us and move us and tell us something about who we are. And it's not just about sort of visual or passive uh, consumption of art. There are particip participatory arts that are important as well. So there's been a lot of study about how singing, dancing, playing, creating can impact health positively, particularly in more senior populations. So singing helps with improve quality of life. Dancing improves motor skills and cognition. Uh, playing musical instruments helps with uh, reducing dementia risk and creating things generally. Creating art ourselves gives us a higher sense of self-esteem and, and a better quality of life. So we know arts are powerful. They can move us emotionally and they're even good for us if we do it right. And it's not as if there's not economic value to go around. So we talked about the $3.6 trillion in spending in healthcare. The entertainment industry, if we take it all together, television, movies, music, internet, advertising, I mean, a whole, a gaming, all of that together is about $700 billion a year. Not 20% of what we spend on healthcare. There's a huge opportunity there if we can get all of those creative people that know how to tell story and move us and bring them into the healthcare sphere. But to do that, we need some technology to help because we need things that are immersive, that are fully engaging, that get us emoting, right? Get us feeling and connecting with why we wanna make these changes in our lives. And critically, it needs to be scalable. We've heard several stories today about the impact that an individual person can have on the lives of others. And they're super inspiring stories. And that is unequivocally good. The challenge is there aren't enough of those good people with the right skill sets with the amount of time to go around we have a huge problem with access to care in this country, particularly in behavioral health, which has a big impact on our physical health. 
So we need a technology to help us with this. I want to posit to you that there is something relatively new in terms of the consumer era of this that is better than anything that's ever come before that will help us do this. It is virtual reality. VR is not actually new. It's been around a couple of decades. What's new is it's coming out of the lab and being ready for consumer-grade deployment. I want to tell you a quick story. We have to respect copyrights at TED, so follow me here. Think about a villain from outer space that lived a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And he's tall, and he's dressed in black, and he wears a black helmet, and he's got a really cool weapon. You with me? We know who this is? Think about the first time you saw that character on screen, busting through the door with the stormtroopers boarding the ship, and you thought, whoa, this is scary, right? Well, it wasn't nearly as scary the first time I laid eyes on him as the first time he laid eyes on me. I was in a loading bay of a spaceship fighting stormtroopers, and he showed up, and he's over here, and he turns and he looks at me, and he sees me, and he comes at me. And I'm telling you, I felt it. I felt a physiological response. My fight or flight response said, we are toast. He's scary. He's big. He's imaginary. But it was powerful. Now, I'm not just such a, I am a geek, but I'm not such a big geek that I sit around imagining this stuff. I actually did this. I did this in a location-based entertainment experience in virtual reality. I'm going to mention them because they're local here in Salt Lake City. It's called The Void. If you ever get a chance in any city where they have an installation to do The Void, go do it. It will, it will make it real for you how different VR is. It is a multi-sensory experience. And the reason it is has to do with our brains. And here's, in a nutshell, how our brains work. We have these models running in our heads all the time of who we are, what we're doing, who you're sitting next to, are you safe, are you comfortable, are you bored yet, whatever. And if you pull out your smartphone and you look at something on there, an app, a game, an email, whatever, Here's what your brain's model does. Everything you had before, plus that. It's additive, it's cognitive, it's not a big deal. You might get distracted, but it's not game-changing. With VR, it's different. We replace one or more, generally at least two, generally sight and sound, but it can be more. It can be touch, it can be smell, proprioception, maybe taste someday. We replace those sensory inputs. And for our brain, that's really, really different. It's not additive anymore. It's our new reality. That's why VR is so uh, aptly named. And here's what our brains do with that. The part of our brains that sort of do impulse control and rational thought is the neocortex. That's sort of the newest, youngest part of our brain in evolutionary terms. The part of our brain that makes the decisions about behavior is the limbic system. This is our older lizard brain. This is where we make decisions in split seconds. And that's important. That's how we've stayed alive through the millennia. Right? So my fight or flight response needs to be instant. If one of the farm animals here comes charging in, I need to get out of the way quick. Right? So the limbic system is what's making the decisions, but it has no capacity for language. All the language and rational thought is in the neocortex. And how do we seek to educate people and get them motivated about their health? With language, with just explaining to them why it's really, really important that they take their medication. It's not enough. It's not working. So with VR, we have a new, new opportunity. VR is very immersive. How immersive? Well, let's look at a couple examples. Hunter Hoffman, researcher at University of Washington, has done some famous and pioneering work with the power of VR to distract us. There's much more we can do with VR. This is a lot of what you'll read about in the news. This is really powerful. People in excruciating pain, burn victims and the like, who can be uh, offered relief from acute pain because of the immersive power of VR. Another example of the immersive power of VR, its ability to transport you somewhere else, is done by Skip Rizzo at University of Southern California and the Institute of Creative Technologies. Skip has done a bunch of pioneering work in VR. One of his more famous things is a program called Brave Mind, which is a PTSD experience for combat veterans. And he's got virtual Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's a really powerful, very cost-effective and scalable approach to PTSD treatment. So immersive is there. We need interactive as well. So interactive means we can get our full body into the game. So that geeky guy there is me. And what I'm doing is battling that ancient space villain that we talked about a few minutes ago. 
And I'm not very athletic, as you can see. But what I am doing, I am into it. I am in another place. I've got a weapon in my hand. I'm in danger, and I'm into it. And it is a really powerful thing. Now, why does this matter? Amy Cuddy did a, uh, a, a TED Global presentation back in 2012. It's totally worth a watch. It's one of the most watched of all time. And she wasn't talking about health, but she was talking about how our body language changes who we are. She said our bodies change our minds, our minds change our behavior, and our behaviors change our outcomes. And she was talking about things like, you know, the Wonder Woman pose, and if you do that, you feel more powerful. And if you open up and you, and you project, it changes who you are and it changes your outcomes. It's about that physicality. And if you think about health, it's even more important, right? We need to get out of just an intellectual exercise, a neocortex exercise about how we ought to live healthier and get involved in moving and changing our bodies. Most critically is emotive. We need to feel things, right? Let's go back to what matters most in our life. It's emotion. There is no behavior change in a sustained way without emotion. And with VR, we can create connection and empathy. This is a really simple example. This is a patient narrative from one of our programs where you meet Kathy. Kathy tells you about her story and her journey with chronic pain, and she tells you about how she got over it. That's all it is. But you feel like you're in the room with her, and you're hearing her story and seeing her and connecting with her and feeling like you're not alone, and you can make this journey too. And there are, that's scratching the surface. This is where we need to enlist Hollywood. We need the science of the, the clinicians and all of that medical science that keeps us safe. We need to bring the art, and we need to bring activation, right? Immersion, engagement, emotion. That's how we're going to improve, better, uh, improve health. And when we do that, and in so doing, we can address a whole range of uh, afflictions. Chronic stress, chronic pain, addiction, uh, uh, disease management programs, eating disorders, and on and on. And that doesn't even sort of focus on the behavioral health aspects. And, you know, this, uh, you, you started us there... Mandy, and it's obviously a big area of focus that we need to think about. When we do that and we do it well, this is the business side of it. All, right, all, the, all the entertainment industry executives in the room are watching that are wondering if you need to get involved in this. Think about this. Think about the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in value that are wasted and that have negative impacts on our lives that are being spent in the healthcare system. Let's redirect some of that into... The, the, the coffers of the entertainment industry, and let's take all of that talent, all that amazing storytelling and artistry, and bring story into healthcare. Let's find the longer version of the white teeth, right? Let's get people engaged in how this really matters and why this really matters to them. So that's our new formula. You didn't know you'd have to do math today, but it's, it's clinicians for the science, Hollywood for the emotion and the story, and VR, critical new medium for the immersion and engagement which our brains process like nothing we've ever had before. We do that, we have a shot at moving health behaviors and improving our health. Thank you.